Hey, welcome to Answers with Experts. My name is Benjamin. I'm a social gerontologist with Kelsch Communities. I'm very excited to be part of this series in which we are featuring different experts who have some really exciting things to share. Um, what we're doing is we're asking families like yourself or professionals like yourself to share questions ahead of time with us. And then we bring their questions together. And we present them to the expert and let them share some of their thoughts, some of their insights. So today's questions, I'm going to show them to you real quick, are we have a question from Becky, who's going to be asking about a, someone she cares for who does a lot of yelling and just won't stop. And Anne, Anne is trying to figure out how to help her husband who just wants to keep leaving and going home, even though he is home. Lynn and George are curious about how can exercise help even advanced dementia, as well as how do we handle someone who can't recognize us when we visit? Thea has a similar question. How do I make sure my visits are positive when dad can't remember anything from her past, his past? And Dana and Crystal, they're working with someone who gets very sad and very upset when husband leaves. Um, so anyway, those are the questions we'll be dealing with. But I'd like to introduce to you our our um, expert today. Our expert is, is is John from Portugal. He is with Humanitude, a team that has trained over 50,000 people, and over a thousand uh, organizations in about 12 different countries. And I like to say he's kind of like the Gordon Ramsay of caregiving. He goes into the craziest places, hospitals, et cetera, and helps people that no one else can help. So he's here today to share with us. Hey, John, you want to give a shout out to all of our guests today? Hello. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here all the way from Portugal to US. It's a short world nowadays with the internet resource. Yeah. So thank you very much for having me once again. I'll try to be at my best. Compare me to Gordon Ramsay is always a, <laughs> a bit of a two-edged sword. I don't know which way <laughs> I should take it. But, uh, but yeah, it's true. We try to, to take on board the challenging situations and we try to make the best out of it. And um, as a matter of fact, it is a fun job because we do get the fun side of it. <laughs> so yeah, very rewarding. We're, we're really happy to have you. And let's, let's get started with our first question. Um, I was thinking we could go ahead and maybe um, work on the question that Anne had about wanting to go home all the time. Does that sound good for you? Okay, let's play that video and then we'll get started with that. I'm curious, my husband's brand new there, only a week and a half or so. Um, about how long do you think it takes for someone to acclimate when they are still fairly lucid? He, he's very aware that he's someplace he is not home. A firefighter, uh, he was a baseball player. Um, he's lost interest in almost everything lately. And so uh, even friends have passed away or they're not close by. And so he's very lonely and very upset that nobody calls him yet. <laughs> I keep saying it's only been a week. Uh, and he's sure it's been a month, but, and when am I gonna come and take him home? Yeah, so first of all, uh, shout out to with great empathy for this family because first of all it's really tough to put yourselves out there like this so and i can see that there's a lot of struggle going on so um first of all i want to put you at ease saying that I, i've been through the same with my uh, late grandfather the struggles we had as a family now i have a, a grandmother going through the same process so I, I i feel exactly where you're coming from so couple of things that we should look out for is that uh, a person with dementia, uh, regardless of their stage, will always um, keep an emotional uh, ability because cognition and emotional are dealt with in different parts of the brain and dementia does not affect emotional skills, which means that people still feel. And what they feel is very real. Uh, this takes us to the downside and it can take us to the upside. So first of all, something that I tend to tell everybody is that we should really prepare ourselves for our future care because we all are going to be dependent. We're all going to be needing care. So ideally, we should start preparing in advance before we move into a community. Um, and for that, there could be a transitional period, something that we start to get adjusted to the place 
realizing that this is going to be our our home. If this is not possible, everything else should be aligned in terms of uh, as environmentally friendly as it could, like to be as as homey as possible. I've seen most of your communities; they are spot on in terms of decoration. Uh, if you can make it personal, even the better. Try to bring more familiar objects, familiar furniture, familiar pictures, and try to bring some value to his presence in there, some purpose. Back in Europe, we're talking about a project of life. What is the project of life of this person in this uh, community? What is the person going to do there? Just to hang is not enough. It's boring. It's upsetting. It's frustrating. What is my purpose here? What? How can I help this organization to function? They can have a skill set that can actually makes their presence more purposeful. Like he, I hear that he was a firefighter. Why not at the beginning help ask him to to revise the fire plans, see if he sees anything in place that could be held, could be adjusted or or revised. You know, try to make them. Make make this person proud and, and and useful on this on this community. Also, the sense of belongingness that he's part of it and he has people in it that are his friends and that he can rely on as well. This can be a bit challenging because it is hard to link people due to tastes, due to values, due to uh, if we're introverts, for example, it's more hard to it's harder to to make friends. But um, but if you get a, promote the sense of belongingness, it could be useful. Um, obviously, your presence is always the most important one, especially at the beginning. We talk about roughly, um, on average, 14 days of replacing an emotional memory, which means that the emotional memory is the sense of fami familiarity. Are we familiar with the place? Are we not? Do we feel that we belong? Do I recognize the place? I do not. Um, so about 14 days on average to replace this emotion. So the first two weeks are going to be crucial. So for these two weeks, your presence as a family uh, to facilitate, to create this bridge with the community is uh, very, very good. Also, another thing we tell is that this person will require a lot of what we call free acts, validating care. And this means that uh, validating care is, is small interventions that are just to make the person feel good about himself in this case and to feel good about the place and the care that is happening. So this can be used as a, um, a small relational uh, kind, uh, uh, act of kindness, a smile, uh, how are you, uh, uh, a caress every time I see you, uh, as much as I can throughout the day. I will require uh, to, to have a particular attention to everything I bring is with attention to detail. So I didn't just get water, I got water for you. I didn't just got meal. I, I, I have this meal that, and I thought you were the person who's going to enjoy it the most. So try to give a sense that the person is important and everything we do, even if it's incorporated already with the community um, daily tasks, to make the person feel that this is specially for him. I got you coffee. I got you tea. I got you water. I got you dinner. I got you breakfast. I, I thought of you. I came here purposely to see you today. I could be home on my day off, but I came here to be your caregiver. Uh, so make the person feel important. And another thing is this sense of purpose by asking person to 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 assist in some tasks, even if the tasks are not necessarily that relevant. You know, like we're not expecting him to revise the whole uh, fire action plan, but maybe he can have a sense that he got a, a something to do there. So these are usually the tools that we ask. So a transitional period strong presence of the family, a lot of free acts by positive emotions with the smile, caressing, good morning, niceness, make the person noticed, small tasks that they can fulfill to make themselves uh, useful or purposeful and promote their belongingness in the in the home by creating links with other residents, with other staff that, uh, that are around. And uh, be patient because emotional memories take time to build up. Was I efficient? That, beautiful. that is really <laughs> helpful. Yes, I love that. Because you're really looking at the whole picture, right? You're really looking at the whole picture, not just a simple intervention like, oh, hey, we need to put up a sign that says, you know, your your husband's, your wife's gone or whatever. But you're really looking at what can make him feel like he's at home. That's the thing. I mean, those small interventions, because of cognitive skills, many times they're inefficient. Of course, 
they're useful and we can do them and, and we should do them because it's always a, a, an option and a solution. But from what we understand, uh, em emotional intervention has much more uh, uh, deep impact on the person's uh, happiness overall and, and quality of life, which is what we are aiming here. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I understand our amygdala is less impacted by dementia than our hippocampus, and our amygdala is where the emotional memories are. And so what you're saying makes a ton of sense. That's exactly it. I didn't want to go into neuroscience detail, but yes, <laughs> that's exactly why. <laughs> Thank well, you. Why don't, why don't we play a question from Becky? Becky is a, a director of resident services. She's an RN with over 20 years of experience. Um, she's actually taken training from you and she had a question for you because she's got a situation that's really challenging for her in the community that she manages. Let's listen to what she has to say. Hi, John. This is Becky uh, from Canterbury Gardens. My question is, if you have a resident that hollers help, help constantly, attention seeking for staff but doesn't know what he wants um, because of his decline in his dementia, um, he gets stuck. Um, how do you help uh, reassure, try to offer yourself as being available, but uh, not being successful in getting the person unstuck? you have any tips or tricks? Let us know. Yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah, it's, it, uh, but this is something that comes to us very, very commonly, uh, unfortunately. It's, it's, uh, it's tough to figure it out. And because of that, we kind of came up with a little algorithm that I will try to break down as quick as I can because everybody, everybody's unique, every case is unique, and we have to sometimes try a bit of a hit and miss and, and, and see the case and assess it ourselves. But so uh, if I want to give you the tool is... So everybody becomes um, agitated or upset or frustrated and verbalizes it or uh, demonstrates it physically by being edgy, by being uh, um, anxious, you know, moving around, searching constantly for things. This is usually an expression of, of fear, frustration, anxiety. Okay, so the person is struggling and is not able to communicate it on the appropriate way or in a, in a, in a way that we can understand exactly what's going on. So for us, because the communication is broken, we struggle, we, uh, the rest of the world, we struggle to understand because we did not develop yet these skills of understanding uh, people with cognitive uh, impairment. So first thing I assess on a person like this is if there are any internal biological factors that could be causing him to be upset. So the easiest ones are always to see if the person is in, in pain, see if the person has any sort of fever or underlying infection, which is not manifested by fever. If the person is hungry, thirsty, uh, needs toileting, too hot, too cold. Overall, just is there any physical discomfort? Because everything else that I'm going to say will be compromised if there's an actual physical discomfort. We can do all the non-pharmacological approach, but if there's a physical discomfort, we should first assess that. And by rule of thumb, avoid it even, uh, or, or try to reduce it or eliminate it, even if we're not sure. Like we feed, we give water, we take to the toilet, we give pain medication, just to see uh, what happens if we do so. And then we move on to the next level. So we've covered it all and we did not see anything. So next thing we start thinking is the person has some affectionate needs. So the person feels insecure about this new place, about these people. They don't understand anything and they need the reassurance of someone constantly. Because we do not have the ability to be there at all times, we need to start using a few, a few tricks. So some of the tricks are to have a strong sense of commitment for next care, which is every time I leave the person, I will make sure to tell the person that something next is going to happen. We're, we're not going to leave. You're not going to be alone. You're not going to see me, but I'm here. And I'll be here for you to do this at this time or around this time. If the person has an ability to read or understand some signs, to leave some note on it uh, next to the person could be useful as well. I don't know how, how great skills the, the person has still, but it could be useful. Another thing is to find some replacement objects, which is uh, reassuring objects. Sometimes it's a pillow, it's a comforting blanket, a picture, 
a medal, something that has an emotional value that reassures the person in terms of, of um, familiarity. Uh, sometimes people find uh, uh, help with uh, with dolls, with stuffed toys, with a, with a comforting uh, song or or movie on the telly. Something that is a is a sometimes on the training to give a link. It's not good to link things with children because then people sometimes tr start to be a bit uh, transferring knowledge too easily. But kids to uh, reassure themselves when they're lost, they have a pillow. They have a nappy, they have a pacifier, so they use some, or they have a doll that they carry everywhere. This gives them a sense of reassurance, regardless of the environment, regardless of who they're de dealing with. So it's kind of transferring a bit of this uh, same notion. If um, this is not possible, then we have um, another couple of situations that could be. Perhaps the person is just down bored. The person has a lot of energy build up. They do not have anywhere to escape and they need to do something with it. And if they cannot walk, if they cannot participate in activities, if they cannot do anything productive or useful with that energy, they're going to start escaping it in the way they can, which can be mumbling, uh, being self-centered, repetitive movements, can be shouting, something like that. So sometimes what can be useful, first thing to inter intervention is to get the person to try to stand up and walk if they can. Because if they stand up and walk, if they can march, if they can run fast, try to get the person tired. If they cannot stand up and walk, can they stand up and sit down, stand up and sit down, stand up and sit, like squatting in place. So like this, they get tired. If not, can they move the arms? Can they stretch? Can they hold them up as long as they can? Can they hold up something far away from their body and try to keep it as up as they can? So try to get this um, exercise uh, in place so that the person gets physically tired. Sometimes, because if this is the case, the person is bored and whatnot, we try to give uh, reorientate their attention. So we try to focus their attention on something else other than the shouting, because then this becomes a, a ruminant uh, behavior, like something that the person will keep on doing if nothing else is happening. Once the stimulus stops, I go back to the shouting. So I reorientate their attention. I make them focus on something. But many times we do this by using cognitive uh, activities. You're going to see a television. You're going to listen to me. You're going to listen to music. You're going to look at the scene. But it's something that I stay in place and just focus on. That's still quite mentally and does not get me tired, physically tired. So I need to balance it out sometimes. You know, get the person physically tired first, see if it works. If not, you can also redirect the attention. Um, we're still missing a couple of options is that can be something environmental which we're not aware of and this can be quite tricky because obviously the person's brain has a perception of their own and there are, might be things on the environment that we're not aware of because for us they're perfectly fine perfectly normal but for the person they can be very upsetting it can be loud stimulus sudden stimulus bright light sudden noises loud noises or background noises constantly someone hearing from my back and i don't see where the noise is coming from which is increasing me my sense of, of fear and paranoia some talking behind my back what's happening who's coming so environment can be quite quite tricky to manage so if this is the case try to bring the person to a low stimulant environment and see if that helps by this i mean a place that there's almost nothing happening very quiet very low light, no, no bright colors. See if the person in there is able to calm down. If not, there can still be some preferences, individual preferences. And by this, we mean that the person might have um, some unique habits which are not being met. And be aware that I leave this for last because many times this is the first thing that we focus on because of person-centric care. We try to think like there's some, some uniqueness on this person. That, but if we don't cover the other ones before, <laughs> this last one is going to be very, very uh, inefficient. But obviously it is quite important about rhythms uh, that the person wakes up, that eats, that goes to bed, what's the favorite color, what's the favorite song style. And if there's anything that is being unmet, it can also lead to agitation. What we do know is that by rule of thumb, if it is um, 
uh, related with this, it tends to be a buildup, which means that if the person wakes up as quiet as they can, you know, had a very good night of rest, and they wake up uh, uh, fairly in a good mood, this is a good sign. It means that everything else that comes after that comes. I'm sorry, my my dog barking in the background. I don't know. Is it very loud for you? We can hear you. You're fine. I, I'll tell my kid is on the other room. I'll tell him to go and deal with it. Just a second. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, these usually what I was saying is that if the person wakes up calm. And then there's a buildup and eventually they, they become like this one hour, two hours, three hours, five hours after they wake up. We know that it's a buildup from, from a, a stimulus like this, a trigger like this. If the person already wakes up like this and they had a fairly good night of sleep, we can start talking about baseline. We are not against um, medication. Okay, uh, We have a lot of non-pharmacological approach, which many times are not a solution if we don't know how. But there are pharmacological approaches. We need to see if the person is struggling and it's anxious and it's not able to cope with this anxiety. Like many of us, sometimes we recur to a little pill here and there to, to bring down. The issue that I want to raise is not to keep the person constantly on high doses. Even if we need to start on a high dose to reset, then ideally we go low and low and low until the moment we understand what is the minimum dose that we require, or even if it's required at all. Because we, like we call, this can be a third birth. We bring the person down and then we bring the person back up, introducing one thing at a time and seeing what does the person respond to, if there's a trigger, if we identify which trigger is it. Because as we know, people cannot speak to us and tell us exactly what's going on, but something is going on, either internally or externally, they're feeling stress and they express this stress by shouting. Where does it come from? Many times it's a trial and error. We have to, it's a hit and miss. We try this, we try that. And eventually if we work as a team, doctors, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, the family, the caregivers, the nurses, everybody, we manage many times to identify the, the, the thing. I can I, I illustrate, I know I'm taking a lot of time and I told you that <laughs> with this one I would. There's a little story which I think it's very useful because um, we had this uh, one lady who was uh, the same, shouting the whole day. And we, I, we okay, not we because I, I wasn't part of the team, but when I arrived, the team told me that this was the baseline of the person, that this was who the person is. And this was the assessment, this was the assumption, and everybody accepted that as normal but we cannot and it's not normal for a person to be shouting okay there's always there has to be a reason so we went to we went in to do the assessment and of course this takes about a bit of clinical skills but you can see that the person has a history for example of a stroke the person had more discomfort when turning to one side the person felt quite insecure. The, per the person could understand much more than we thought. So we had to put in place a lot of things. So first of all, we had to deal with pain. We had to deal with positioning. We had to deal with reassurance. So for that, what we had to do, and I'm talking about advanced care planning, really. I hope I'm not boring anyone. This is uh, advanced medical uh, interventions. But uh, when I say medical, I talk on the broad term, uh, holistic. So we had to think of uh, pain management so we had to introduce uh, pain meds uh, on, a, on a regular basis we had to think of the plan the positioning uh, that we care the person that we leave the person at because uh, this this lady was already bed bound at the time but she could not lean to to the right i believe uh, maybe i'm wrong but it's one of the sides she could not turn at all so we had to plan the whole care how to care for the person how to get dressed how to transfer without moving too much and without definitely turning to that side. So that's a whole set skill. Uh, and we had to plan on how to communicate with this person. And by reassuring the person is what? Gaze, eye to eye, the same level, about one hand distance, 
and anticipate everything you're doing by saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and linking what you're doing with positive sensations I know, or, or eventual sensations. I, we're going to transfer you now. We're going to rotate you. We're rotating you. You might feel that you're spinning. It's normal because we're rotating you. Now we're going to slide you to this chair. For that, you're going to have to come forward. We're going to slide you forward. You're sliding forward. Don't be worried. I know it can be a bit anxious, but it's okay. There's a chair right there. See how I'm always engaging with the person by telling what I'm doing, what I'm going to do, possible emotions that are associated to what we're doing so that the person feels more understood, more uh, reassured by what we're doing. So by putting these three together, we managed to finish the shouting completely. Hmm. Completely. Uh, the, the medical team thought it would be impossible. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, once again, it's one of those that you're like, yeah. We made it, so it was it was a fun fun story. But like this, I could I could be here the whole day, you know. But um, but yeah, everybody's unique, huh? So yes, but I like what you said. How in person centered care, we often focus first on what are all the unique things about this person. But I love how you said, wait, there's some basic humanity things that like are common to all of us. Let's make sure we address those first before we go into the how is John different than Benjamin, right? Because there's some things we have in common. If we if we haven't eaten breakfast and lunch and we're hungry right now, we're not going to be okay, right? You don't need to know about my psychological past with my dad until you figured out that I didn't have breakfast, right? That's it. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Uh, we many times, for example, when we approach and we get success stories, many times people link it to the fact that I'm a male, the fact, the fact that I'm, mm. I don't know, that they, they think I'm the son, that, uh, I have a funny accent. I don't know. We try to give all these, uh, possible explanations and, uh, it's nothing to do with me and it's nothing to do with, it's nothing personal in not both ends. Okay. Mm-hmm. So. If this gentleman is shouting, it's not because he's annoying. It's not because he's, he's, he's challenging us, he's teasing us, he's being difficult, which sometimes is what we think. He's just, that's his baseline, that's his behavior. He's just an annoying guy and that's who he is. Not necessarily. Sometimes it is, but very, very, very little prevalence. I don't I don't know the, the statistics, but uh, from my experience, very little. And it's nothing personal towards us. He's not doing that to me, to us, because he wants to offend us or to challenge us or to frustrate us or to annoy us. It's not us. Many times this is how we humans uh, decode this because mm-hmm. these are the skill sets, the social skill sets that we were given as as humans. Like if you're being annoying to me, it's either you have a problem or you have a problem with me, you know, but mm-hmm. and many times we take it personal. So I don't like you as a person or you don't like me as a person. And it's, it's really nothing to do with this. It's a condition. The person mm. cannot express they are not bad people. They're just trying their best to communicate. And we have a problem that we cannot decode that, understand what's going on. So that's why we need this algorithm. And biological, affectionate, occupational, uh, belongingness, uh, environmental, and and then personal preferences. You know, mm-hmm. I leave that usually to last. Mm. If I'll be politically correct, I'd say this is a wheel and everything is equally important. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well hey let's let's hear from dana and crystal now dana and crystal are um two uh care partners who have a question for you they're on the front lines of caring for folks and they have a question for you now president here who came first with her sister put her here and then after about a month her husband came to join her and they are a blended family He's got his family, she's got her family. Whenever he has to go out for a doctor's appointment or just to go out with his family. Whenever he leaves out, she gets scared that he's not coming back. She screams, she fights, she pretty much throws tears stuff up, she throws a fit. And our question is, we try to reassure her that yes, he's coming back. He's just gonna be gone for a couple hours and he'll be back. We try to get her into activities before he leaves. We try to just kind of talk to her before he leaves to get her ready. Our question is, is what else can we do to, to calm her down and to reassure her that he will be back? 
Yeah, to to this one, we we actually have a a cool tool. We call it uh, simulated presence. Uh, so basically, you record the person who is the emotional caregiver to this lady. So this case is the in this case is the husband, and you record him uh, by uh, voice and or video. Nowadays, with the mobile, with the tablet, you have that. I know there's privacy issues, you know, there has to be consent, there has to be within the, the you have to keep the, the formalities on, of course, but, um, but the overall result tends to be really good to put, to actually engage the person with a video of the person who they are missing the most, okay? So, and this sometimes helps to carry out an activity that they both have a strong emotional connection with. Imagine that they both went to Mass on Sundays, having him read a psalm. Imagine that they both belong to a group of a uh, book uh, reading group and having him to explain her a story or if, if they were in a choir to sing with her too. So he would be facilitating the activity with her. But basically this is a recorded activity. Sometimes it helps as well to have recorded messages who we all have this experience that the person becomes so anxious, so frustrated, so insecure that we resort to call the person that the person is looking for, the daughter, the son, the, the husband. And on the phone, what does this relational caregiver, this emotional caregiver is going to say? It's okay. Don't worry. I know you're there. I'll meet you as soon as I can. Uh, you're there with the lovely people. They're going to take good care of you, make yourself at home, enjoy a cup of tea. A standard, why don't we recall this message? And we can put it on every time. Because the, the, the thing is the attention, the, the short spam of attention can actually work to our benefit in this case. Mm -hmm. Because we can use the same message every five minutes, and it doesn't have to be us repeating it; it's recorded, you know. So it's just, oh, good that you're asking. Like, oh, where's my husband? Oh, good, great that you're asking. Here, he left you a message, okay? And this message can then link to the activity. Like, oh, I know you're looking for me. He already knows, I suppose. He anticipates this. So I know you're looking for me. I just had to go out for a doctor's appointment. I'll be back as soon as I can. But you know how these things are. Sometimes we get a bit delayed. But hey, since I have your attention, why don't we do something together? Why don't we read something together? Oh, do you remember the movie we went together? Do you remember the trip to Europe that we had together when you did this and I did that and we shared that meal and we went to visit? And he can entertain her for 30 minutes with a recorded video. And this is actually a, a pretty cool solution that we've implemented and it actually has really good results. So I would strongly encourage you to try this because I see that you've tried everything else. That's huge. That's huge. Another option is if the person can go with him. I don't know if that's possible, but that's a whole different story. But but yeah, if you cannot, I think this is the simplest, easiest thing to, to implement. And you're saying it could be on an iPad, it could be on an iPhone, it could be on the TV you know, with the USB stick, it could be over a phone, audio even if necessary. There's so many different formats it could be done yeah. in. The only thing that has to be is the strongest emotional caregiver that this person has the the, okay. the person who this person values the most hears the most trusts the most you know this is the 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 key aspect okay um i think that that is such a doable thing it's some interventions require a lot of thinking a lot of planning this is an intervention that can literally take five minutes and you're done and you can use it as much as you want. As you say, as it can always be the same mm -hmm. one. That's the fun part. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's listen now to Lynn and George. Lynn and George have two questions for you. Let's hear what they have to say. Lynn and George. And again, I want to say first, real quick, quick commercial break. Thank you to each person who was generous with sharing their personal story. Because I, I know sometimes it feels like, oh, it's my story. And I, no one's interested in it, but let me tell you, when you share your story, you help so many other people who are going through the same thing. And so I do want to recommend that if you're thinking of any situations in your life 
or people you care about, please text hashtag answers to the phone number on the screen and you'll get a response from me today sometime showing you how you can also send your questions in either by audio or video. Would love to hear what you're thinking about and what's on your heart. Whether you're watching this live or recorded, that number will be live 24 seven. Don't worry, it won't wake me up at night. It's, it's silenced at night, but just text there that hashtag. So I know that you're interested in either hearing about future episodes or sharing a question yourself. And just to sweeten the pot, we do have uh, a cool opportunity right now. Um, there is a great book by Dr. John Medina. This is his face right here. And he's, a, he's an amazing uh, neurologist and uh, has written a fascinating book called Brain Rules. Let me see if I can do this. Brain Rules uh, for Aging Well. And it's uh, a in, incredible book, all based on research. It's none of this, hey, here's what I think would help you, right? It's like really based on actual science. These are things we know make a difference in helping your brain stay active. So the first 15 people who text, you know, text hashtag answers to that phone number will receive a copy in the mail. I know a couple of you are listening going, where's my copy? I did this last week. They're uh, on the way from their warehouse and we'll be mailing them out. So please, Put your, put your uh, hashtag answers to that phone number and we'll get you one of those books. Okay, let's hear from Dana and from, I'm sorry, let's hear from Lynn and George. Here we go. Let's go, George. First, so the first question was, um, uh, it, you know, the benefits of exercise are well documented and wondering if anyone has done any type of studies on Alzheimer's patients regarding, uh, you know, mental, not only physical health, mental health, um, with, you know, regular exercise. Um, in case of our um, uncle Dean, he used to, you know, get a lot of daily exercise. Um, but, you know, he walks there, but, you know, it's just, it's nothing like he used to. Um, the second question was, uh, we noticed when uh, we had uh, visited recently that Dean recognized a photo of me, but not me. Although I was not straight on with him, I was to his side at the time. So it could have been a peripheral vision thing, or is it, I mean, is that a, one, is that a typical thing? Two, is there any way to um, use that as sort of a, you know, a therapeutic thing, showing a photo and then the person to try to, you know, get, get uh, some uh, type of recognition of the person. What you said? He pointed out and says, how is George? <laughs> so it sounds like two questions. First one, they're wanting to know, should we keep pushing exercise? And someone's getting on the journey with dementia. And then after that, they're asking, how do we handle he doesn't recognize me when i come how do i visit so from what uh, okay yeah well i'll break it into two so obviously verticality is a big pillar for us so as you know uh, maybe not everybody's aware but uh, the authors of humanitude yves Ginest and josette mariscotti they actually come from a, a physical education background so for them to link health with movement is quite natural because as, as george said there's a lot of studies linking uh, movement and daily exercise with a health status. But another thing he's asking is relating it with well-being. And that's a very interesting question because it's a different aspect. When we first uh, introduced verticality into humanitude, it was considered to be strictly a biological pillar. But now we uh, associate it to an identity pillar. What does this mean? It means that the, the human uh, body was designed to stand up and walk. We operate better our uh, body if we stand up and walk. We were actually designed to walk quite big distances. The immobility is linked to a lot of uh, diseases. And obviously, the more we move, normally, the healthier we are. Obviously, the movement needs to be conditioned, needs to be well done and, and in the right conditions. 
but uh, but obviously by rule of thumb this is this is true but what we see as well is that because we have had this particularity this characteristic for so long in our species that we actually start to associate it to a lot of um, to a lot of other things other than biology we can think like why if, if we see someone walking up straight upright on the street we automatically assume that this person is confident if we see the person walking you know low shoulders looking down kind of hump posture we start thinking that this person is is down is frail maybe is is sick you know so we start associating the posture with the person's personality really saying the attitude that they have just by the way we look that's why we use uh, that's why we dress up fancy that's why we use heels that's why we 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 fancy our looks it's not just because when i look at someone who is tall and fit that they are biologically healthy i also think that they're doing better in life you know i tend to associate this verticality to a mental health we not, might not necessarily be aware of it it's quite instinctive but but we do that because as a species we've lived with people who stood up for for quite a while and we even believe that back in the day this was a, a way that we selected each other you know like the the fitter you are the healthier you are so i'm going to marry you because you're going to live longer and, and have better kids <laughs> so it's a, it's a bit animalistic we don't like to associate ourselves to that but it's still a bit of our instinct but another thing is the impact that it has on us there are a lot of studies w it, that associate the loss of the ability to walk with a huge grief, comparing it to the loss of a son. So we can only imagine, you know, losing a kid and someone psychologically being associated the, the like the the heavy of this grief by losing the ability to walk. It's it's really big, and some people really struggle to overcome uh, to overcome it. And you see that people with disabilities who are uh, motor motor challenge. They have a lot of. Um, they they feel the need to 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 be heard to to be to belong because basically they always feel left out. They always feel put at margin because it's as if they they need to do twice of the effort to prove themselves because this is something that people still look down upon. And because of the, I, I can say this fairly okay because I, I've fortunately I've had the opportunity to work with people with disability quite quite closely and 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 I can say that I have a couple of friends who who are uh, stuck to a wheelchair but uh, so they they hear me out. Uh, but another thing is the way the person feels when they lose the ability to walk then really hits uh, the lowest part. So I have a video, for example, of a lady who who we, we managed to do three, four steps. And her testimonial is quite touching because she tells us as it is that what we did was amazing. It really made her to feel alive. When she's sitting down the whole day, she feels like she's dead. She has no hope for life anymore. And giving two or three steps, it gave her hope. So uh, obviously, this that she's talking is not about lungs and kidneys and intestines and 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 heart it's talking about mental health how she feels the motivation that she has and for us this is the first thing that we should be working as caregivers we should not talk about care in regards of needs we should be talking about desires because I will eat if I want to, if I have pleasure, if it, if I have motivation, I will get out of bed, if I will take a shower, I'll get dressed, I'll go out, if I feel like it. It's not because I have to. You know, nowadays, we live in a world that we are driven by desire, not by need. So because of that, we need to be aware that when we approach the person, first thing we need to work with is motivation. And verticality is a great way to work with this motivation. So it's very common for us that the first thing we try to do is to get the person to move, to sit up, to stand up, give a few steps, even before we do any other care, even before we propose anything else, because this gives a sense of, of belief, of hope. 
and also of trust because from that moment on they trust us so what we say is that everybody should have a, a, a verticality profile assessed with the help of a professional see how much are they able to stand up according to that have a verticality prescription which means that how much will they stand up when how with what technique and ideally everybody would stand up and walk for 20 minutes a day not necessarily in a row can be fragmented broken into different times of the day but ideally this would be done with every one and this reduces the the bad uh, bad rhythm prevalence by 96 percent roughly what we see in humanity units is that only about four percent of the people living in these communities communities are actually uh, bed bound bedridden so if we actually promote verticality we get much more out of everyone in many ways not to talk about biology i mean i could be talking here in organically how prevent heart disease how it prevents diabetes how it prevents uh, swelling of the lower limbs how it prevents chest infections how it prevents uh, constipation uh, I mean, I could go on. So, but mentally, yes. So this question of George is really spot on. Uh, we should be working on it quite a lot because of this motivation that many times we all hear this in the in any community, people that are getting old because a, a, aging is still quite uh, stigmatized, still quite negative in, in the social view. And we it's common to hear an older adult to say that, um, oh, why am I here? Why don't I die? I'm just a, a burden on anyone. And of, of course, if a person is with this kind of speech, it's very hard to engage with, first of all, because, you know, it's such a, such a drag, you know, I have to go and visit. It breaks my heart. And another thing is, how do I encourage the person to, to care? Because why should they eat? Why should they get up? Why should they walk? they're going to die anyway, you know? So it's, it's a, it's a whole work that we need to get around this, this motivation and this mental health of the older adults and, and population in general, to be mm -hmm. fair, mental health is still the, the distant cousin. I really, this is profound to me and I don't know if many people caught this, but you know, we want to look first at, is there research that shows that this will actually do something to my body or to my mind. What you're saying is before we even get there, we already know that exercise and standing and walking and things like this dramatically impact someone's mental health, their sense of well-being. And so for no other reason, that in itself is worth every intervention we can put in place to make sure the elders that we care for, work with, are able to stand and move and experience life. That's profound. By rule of thumb, we say that we only, we don't promote verticality only on very few patients, which are that have a medical condition that forbids it. Like they have a hemorrhagic stroke. It's, it's not advised for the, for the, the following days, or there's any medical contraindication to it because there's a refusal. And we respect the person's decision no matter what. No forced care. It's a principle of humanity. And if it does not benefit the, the risk or the suffering that it will cause. Imagine that it's a terminally ill patient. It's hurting. Every time we move, every time we touch, we're going to promote verticality because it will improve on this, that, and the other. But the person is going to be suffering the whole time mm -hmm. there's no benefit to it obviously so this is all we have medical condition that forbids it uh, a refusal from the person and when the benefit does not compensate the risk and the risk most of the times is associated to agony and pain mm -hmm. so everybody else they should be verticalized and this means that the best thing is to stand up and walk the second best thing is to stand up the not so right after comes the standing up and sitting down as much as they can, like doing squats. Then they come the sitting up and only then comes the laying down. So we should start from up down until we get to the point that we realize that there's no more that we can do in terms of verticality. But when that day comes, we know that the end is very, very near. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. I want to address the second piece of this question about visiting with someone not recognizing 
me when I visit them. But I want to play our last question because they're very close together and then we can address them at the same time. So let's let's hear from um, Thea on how do we have a good visit. Her question is a little different because it's also about they don't even remember things that we used to talk about. And the other question is more about they don't remember me, but I think both questions are related. How do we have a good visit? I guess, uh, so Connie's my mother-in-law, Phil's my husband, her son. Uh, and more recently, uh, we feel that she's well cared for and, and she's more content and she's settling in, uh, but she's starting to lose the connection between uh, who we are and and putting a name to us, but is still comfortable with us and happy to see us. And just wondering if you would have any advice for family members as you t as you start to lose, which uh, you hear everybody losing their person in these ways. Um, how how do you manage that? And 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 do you need to correct it? Like we always greet her. I was, they'll, you know, they'll bring her down and they'll be like, oh, Connie, your family's here. And I'll be like, hey, Connie, it's me, your favorite daughter-in-law, your only daughter-in-law. And, you know, I always try to sort of help her orient, like, who I am and what my name is without being, you know, doing the wrong one, like, oh, do you know who I am? So I just wondered, like, if there's strategies um, for keeping those connections as they start to get lost and what's okay to say and maybe what isn't uh, helpful um, so that we still feel she knows we love her and are connected to her in some way, even if she can't quite identify that. I think so, yeah, we, we feel that shift. Mm -hmm. um, you know, showing pictures or Phil will tell stories now from childhood and she enjoys them, but she'll blatantly say, oh, I don't remember that at all. And it's really crushing on our side. Um, and we understand why she doesn't, but, um, you know, is there, are there other ways of sharing her past with her and, and just keeping it positive um, and not making her feel bad, like telling a story or going through a, a photo book. We usually try to bring some photos and we use the familio and we'll look at it with her and we'll tell her the stories of the pictures. Um, and she just rarely does, is she connected to what she's seen, um, but enjoys it. Yeah, it's heartwarming, the dedication. Huh? It's amazing. Yes. Oh my the gosh. The dedication of people I think that are trying. Their loved ones. So it's really nice to hear. Yeah. A lot of thought into it as well. Yeah. So it's very good. Um, so, okay, so a couple of things that we need to be clear on is that the timeline fades off with the disease, which means that the person will start struggling to have access to more recent memories. And gradually, they will have further and further uh, as the disease goes, they will have, they'll struggle more with the older memories. So, uh, in theory, at the end of the, the, the disease stage, the people will not be able to recall any memories. So that says the theory. Um, what we also see as well is that uh, people might struggle to have access to memories because memories can be linked to different uh, things and they can be stored in different places and uh, the roadmap can be a bit messy on the brain so sometimes they can have access sometimes they don't have access to them so that can be a bit confusing to us as well because sometimes they remember sometimes they don't remember and for example the question of george was that like he can recognize me on a photo but he cannot recognize me when i'm here this can be for different reasons you froze there but it, oh, yeah, yeah it's good uh, yeah yeah uh, but so we we have to be aware is that sometimes people struggle to identify us because of the timeline because the way we look today it's not the way they remember us because they remember us much younger with different features or it can just so be because when i have a photo i have other things linked to this object that is not here at the moment so my memories have my brain uses more than one stimulus to put things together one and one plus uh, one plus one equals two he, on the photo, I have the one and one, two. On real life, I have one and one equals three, you know, for example, to make it a bit simpler. 
so something that we tend to to appreciate is that first of all is the connection that you create with the person um you were saying that um the george was saying the the purple vision i assume it's because out of the visual field mm -hmm. so we talk about of a, a a tunnel vision uh, on people with uh, with dementia we do not necessarily like to talk about tunnel vision because it's not necessarily true, particularly when people are anxious and extremely uh, frightened. So what we do talk about is what we call a relational deafness, which is if you're not immediately in front of me within a right distance, you are out of my visual field, you're out of my attention. And because of that, my brain does not have enough cognitive abilities to hear you and understand you. So mm. if you're sitting next to the person on the side, talking to the person, and the person's attention, the focus is straight, you don't exist. You're out of the person's world. And therefore, you know, again, like I don't uh, doing this link, you know how when you want a kid to really pay attention to you, like, hey, stop, look at me, I'm talking to you. All right, this is centering the person to make sure that they understand that we are there, that we exist, and we are interacting. And then, on this interaction, we need to make sure that there's no space for miscommunication, especially in nonverbal cues. Humans are very smart on picking up nonverbal cues. How's your attitude? How do you feel about me? How's your tone of voice? How are you? Are you upset? Are you frustrated? We are reading each other constantly. And so we cannot send mixed signals. Otherwise, it will not compute. So the distance that we are from the person should be between one arm's distance and one hand's distance. Okay, so more than that, I don't care. I'm out there. Too near is like, what do you want from me? Okay, so between one arm, one hand. And then the level, as the same level, or if at least lower, never higher than the person, because higher is intimidating, is aggressive. It's a superior look. Like, what do you want? You know, it can be aggressive and the person can respond. Exactly. Another thing is the length of our gaze. If we do not focus, if I'm talking to you and I keep on looking away, what's going on? Either you're not paying attention to me, you're paying attention to something else, or you're lying. Because look me in the eye and tell me the truth. We say this to each other. So if you really want the person to listen to you and trust you and engage with you, you interact eye to eye, and you stay there for as long as you can. Of course, it can be too intimidating if you're just gazing and you're not talking. <laughs> right? So you need to engage at the same time with the speech. And the speech, you have to pay attention to the tone of voice mostly. So the tone of voice, what we talk about is ideally is going to be calm, which is usually associated to lower uh, frequencies. Not high pitch, not high speed, you know, low frequencies, paced. And by paced, uh, we don't mean with necessarily long breaks, you know, because sometimes people talk to you like that. It's like, oh, sorry, I'm not a moron. They like talk to me like the person. So what we say is lower your tone of voice, pace with some intonation. So you can. It's like a rocking intonation. So if I would professionalize my speech right now, I would lower my voice, right? And I would go up occasionally and then go up and then go down. And then how are you doing today? I see that you're doing very well. So like this, you're making the person more drawn into you, kind of more most hypnotically. Um, the touch should be in a neutral area where the person tolerates. The rule of thumb, the arm is okay. And ideally, we can caress the person, which is about to engage the C fibers, not to get to technically, it's about like two to three centimeters per second. So it's a caressing, not pulsating, not vibrating, it's caressing. On a neutral area, this goes a long way. So like this, you make sure that the person is with you. If you have at least two of these pillars of the three, we're talking about gay speech and touch, if you have two at least, you're not going to be likely to lose the person's interest, okay? Another thing is when you introduce yourself, try to create a link with the person that the person is more likely to recognize. In this case, the daughter-in-law as a first approach can be risky. Most of the times we encourage you to say, or either you don't create a link, it's just me, John, 
or I like to say, it's me, it's John, it's your old friend, I came to see you. Okay, friend is a more generic um, term. Ideally, we say that uh, cognitive stimulation and who am I and where are you, reorientation, all these things usually are linked to higher anxiety. High anxiety leads to poor performance in cognitive skills. Mm. If I'm stressed, if I'm anxious, I will struggle more to understand, to remember. So try never to create this panic. So always provide a, a, a safe answer, a safe, a safe um, word that the person is more likely to understand. So, hello, how are you? I came to see you. You address the person by the name that they recognize, you know, and uh, it's not necessarily mom, it's not necessarily uh, uh, grandma. It's sometimes the, the first name, sometimes the, the diminutive name, like the, the family name that they use, you know, like Mimi or, you know, something that is more uh, easier for the person to connect with. I'm here to see you, long time no see. I'm so happy to see you, me, 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 me. It's not you, it's me. I am happy. I don't know how you are yet. And then I introduce the touch, I introduce the gaze, and then I try to link to something that is happening now, at the moment. I see that you're doing this. I see that not necessarily where she is, but I see that you're doing what's happening or we're going to do something together, okay? We're going to go and grab some tea. We're going to go and grab some coffee. We're going to go for a little walk, enjoy ourselves. Something that we share in the moment, not necessarily in the future, not necessarily in the past. And as we are doing this thing, then we can start linking things so that we associate where is the person at the moment. For example, so what have you been up to? So how has the how has life been? If you want to even be more more generic, you know, and you you start to figuring out like what do you do? What keeps you busy? You know, what do you enjoy spending your days doing? You know, and the person is gonna start giving you answers, and with those answers you start picking up where are they exactly on the timeline, rather than asking how old are you? You know, it's gonna be. Quite intimidating because sometimes people won't even be aren't sure and they are embarrassed of that so they can tell you like oh i i go out walking most days like okay well, what period of her life she went walking most days maybe when she retired maybe when she had uh, kids in school i don't know we try to figure it out and then we start relating the questions and the talks to that period of their life and now we have a way to get into the memory lane but associated to the time that the person is. And what we see is that if we create a link and we create this uh, safe environment and this positive emotional connection with the person, the person is actually able to come further and further to the future, closer to our hmm. present. Hmm. Never to our present, but for, to give you a quick story, like my, my grandmother, uh, she's, she's going through a, 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 an Alzheimer's uh, process. And she's, she's still in the early stages, but she's getting more and more uh, impaired. And uh, it was my father's birthday. And last Sunday, we went off for, for a little celebration. And on the way there, I was driving her. And she's telling me that, oh, my, uh, my son, how old is he? Like, oh, wow, he's already that age. It's like, so that means that, means that I'm 70. She's 86, okay? And I did not tell her anything. So that means that I'm 70. I was like, oh, wow, really? How old were you when you had that? And she said, she said, I don't, she said, I don't think I should be saying numbers in, in <laughs> about ladies, but yeah, she said an answer that did not make much sense. And she, she stopped there, you know, kind of halfway, she, she put a break on it. And then I saw that she was, she was struggling like, like, she knows the disease. She understands, she understands, she knows what she has. She doesn't understand fully. Uh, we keep on, on bringing her to it, but uh, saying that it's perfectly normal, you know, this is normal. It's okay, don't worry. So I changed subject, we go around. We had a nice day. On the way back, she was perfectly able to recall how old was she. So just to tell you that after the person feels happy and safe and, and bubbly, they're more likely to be able to, mm. to call those memories. Mm. So if, if the person is not going there, do not force it. Try to go around. Uh, what I tend to say is that our happy-go-lucky attitude tends to lead to a greater quality of life further down on the disease. Mm -hmm. The more anxious, the more pressure we put on, the more frustration we put on, the, the more insecure we make the person feel, the worse it will be 
in terms of cognitive and emotional stability f- towards the future. So, so my, my best advice is always to be creating a, a positive emotional connection, enjoy the moment, perhaps recall safe memories that you're sure that the person is able because most of the times it's because they brought it up and then you can start bringing cues make challenge the person a little bit you know like you know like i did like how old were you when you had that you know that's a challenging question right there i know that but i know that after poking i need to comfort you know like it's okay i'm gonna challenge you i'm gonna hurt you emotionally but then i need to comfort you like ah it's all right you know we're gonna today we're gonna enjoy ourselves so try to bring that into balance as well have always a positive emotional balance with the person you know i love the way that you went right for very physical things that we humans need to do to create a positive connection with another human i if i was answering this question I would have gone right for, well, let's think of 10 different activities that you could do together that don't rely on your your past or something, right? But what you did is you said, no, we need to start with where are you looking with your eyes? What level are you? How are you in, in coming into their space and helping them feel like you really care about them and that they're able to see you and have a connection? Like, that's brilliant to start there because almost all of us can ha- we have work to do in that area, right? We can be as creative as we want coming up with fun new activities to do with our loved one, but we've got to start here. I love that. Yeah, what we talk about, it's motivation and engagement. You know, like how do you motivate the person to participate in care? And how do you engage with the person? How do you connect with the person? Because what we say, care relies on two fundamental aspects, motivation and trust. I need to want it and I need to trust you to go with you, you know. So these two things are before any care activity. When we talk about care, we talk about uh, from getting up to getting dressed, to go for a walk, to go to an activity, to go to the doctor, to visit someone. Any care act for us is something that in the end will result in a better well-being of the person. The person will feel better about him or herself after whatever they went through with us so for that the first thing we need to work is connect with the person work the motivation and then work the trust and if we work these two aspects the person will do anything with you and it will be happy by doing so if there's no motivation if there's no trust whatever you do is going to be exhausting and frustrating for both of you Mm. so first things first connect emotional connection and, and motivation to live for life. Mm-hmm. Well, John, thank you for being with us for this episode. We're looking forward to next month. We've already got questions rolling in about next month. We've got some questions queued up for next month. It'll be a great discussion. Again, I love learning from you. It is always a privilege and honor. And we're just so thankful that you chose to spend some time with us and the families that we work with today. We really, really appreciate it. No, thank you. I mean, as you know, I'm... I only know so much. I learn more sometimes with you guys and your questions and your approach than I ever thought of. So keep on bringing me up. And I think it's good to have us sharing the ideas. And thank you for synthesizing it at the end of my answers. I always get lost a bit in my thoughts and I don't know if it's straightforward enough, but uh, I, no, I try. Very clear. <laughs> very clear. So for all of our, our guests, whether recorded or live, uh, you can always look in the description to find the phone number to text, hashtag answers to with your questions, your comments. We'd love to see you on the show as well. So please do connect with us. All right. Hey, John, we'll see you next month, last Wednesday of the month, same time. Thank you very much. I'll see you then. (laughs) 